Well, we are in, uh, I'm going to begin in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, kind of read into this. And the issue that we saw last week that Paul's talking about is he's talking about harmony or peace and heading towards love. And love is kind of that, the fulfillment that's going to bring everything together. And the idea here is that we would then be this, this group, we'll just call, we'll write the word church, or this body, that, you know, function together. We're really, in, in, right around in verse 12, we're really getting to the place where we've already talked about individual salvation, individual, you know, responsibilities, what Christ has done for us. And it, it's good for us to be individually saved and individually to be sanctified and maturing. But the idea, the real power comes when believers start coming together and learning how to work together. And socially, as we saw last week, uh, there's going to be problems. I mean, there's going to be issues. There's personalities. There's past experiences. There's different desires. There's our own human natures. Then there's sin or there's misunderstandings. And all of those things have to be worked through. You can't just keep getting offended. You, know, you just can't keep breaking relationships and just never get anywhere. And that's probably one of the downfalls of, uh, of Christianity is just the continuous you know, derailing of the plan of God. If somehow it can, it can stay on track, if you read in the Old Testament, it talks about where one will put a thousand to flight and ten will put ten thousand to flight. It's that multiplying effect. You know, one can only do so much, but when you start multiplying, you know, when you get ten, you can do you know, more than ten to a hundred times the work. And so again, there's power in the individual believer, there's power in the individual gifts, but I think Paul is focusing here and kind of trying to encourage the Colossians, when you come together and work together, now you've got a multiplying effect. It's not just one person working, it's two or three or four per people and their gifts being multiplied. And so we begin in chapter 3, verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, as God's chosen you, you're holy, meaning you've been set apart, sanctified, and dearly loved. Because you are chosen, you're holy, you're dearly loved by God. Now you, because that's who you are, you clothe yourself. And again, what a great place to be, chosen, holy, dearly loved. But if we do not clothe ourselves in these characteristics, that stuff will all be uh, unaffected. It, it will be less effective than it could be. We need to be compassionate. It says, clothe yourself or put these things on. And this is the image of, of this new self. Since this is your new self, clothe yourself with this new, new character. Compassion, kindness, and all these things, if you look at them, these are all, every one of these is social. There's none of these things about avoid greed, you know, avoid lust, you know, avoid, you know, these immorality. Those, those come up in other lists. And as far as maybe a personal list, you should not be lustful, you should not be greedy, you should not, you know, watch your heart, guard your heart. These are not talking about these, these are talking about when you get together with other people, be compassionate with the other people. And you're talking about Christians and believers. Be kind to the other believers. Be humble or humility with the other believers. Gentleness, patience, and, and the list continues in verse 13. Bear with each other. And again, that means when they start being offensive or they start, you know, kind of, you know, their personality starts coming through, bear with it, carry it. Again, Paul makes it very clear. There's a place to draw a line and say no more. We saw in church on Sunday when he's in the church of Corinth, they, they, the Jews became what? Abusive. They disagreed with him. They argued with him. He answered their question. The priest, and they became abusive. He goes, finally, he just takes his coat off, shakes the dust off and says, I'm done. I'm going to leave you behind. And so there is a place when people become abusive or ridiculous to leave them behind. But that's not what he's focused on here. Bear with each other, which indicates you just can't, every time you get offended or upset, isn't a time to just move on. Sometimes it's a time for you to just put up with it. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. So notice again between bear with each other and forgive, those are two different things. Bearing with another person kind of gives the impression they haven't done anything wrong, they're just annoying. They haven't done anything wrong, they just maybe are overbearing, or your personalities don't mesh together. Bear with it. You make it work. Then it goes on, and forgive uh, whatever grievances you may have. Now, then, now there is something that needs to be, there is a problem, and you forgive. Now, notice what it says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And we mentioned this again last week. 
Uh, how does the Lord forgive us? There's never a time when you get together with the Lord and you sit down and you say, well, we both kind of made a mistake. You know, the Lord apologized for what he's done wrong and you for, for apologize for what you've done wrong. And you reconcile, kind of like, you know, if you and your spouse, and maybe that's what happens with you, but you and your spouse have an argument. Usually it takes two to tango, you know, and it's like, you know, I've done something wrong. Well, I could have handled it better. And you kind of all back down and rebuild the situation. Uh, that's not how you, the Lord forgives you, because the Lord is never wrong. The Lord never was overbearing. The Lord never overreacted. The Lord never has to say, I know, I got a little out of hand. It, it, when he forgives us, it's him completely saying, I was completely bearing you. You completely sinned against me, but I completely forgive you. So again, in this case right here, saying that's how you should work with each other. Not necessarily trying to draw a line who's right, who's wrong. It's like you take the entire responsibility and you forgive them. Verse 14, and over all these virtues, and notice right here, these are called virtues. I would also use the word fruits. I mean, the text says virtues, but these are fruits over all these virtues. In Galatians, you've got the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. This is another list, but more again, like I said, in that social set of interacting with each other. But over all of these virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And on the notes last week, I wrote it out as, as far as the way that it's saying right there, that you, you, you put this love, is it's the completeness. The love, bring, the love brings the completeness. So when you're doing all of these other things, when you bring love, that's going to bring that love, and it is, it's got an article, it's got the love in the Greek, it's got the article there, the direct article, the love. Whatever that act would be, whatever it's talking about, the love brings the completeness. It is, and that word completeness is the word teleos, the teleos. It, it's, the, it's, where, it's the target. When you're doing all these things, if you'll then do it in a selfless way for the benefit of others, that love will bring the completeness or the teleos, the goal, the maturity. And Paul is talking here about, I think, a group of believers moving on, doing the things God called, 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 us, called us to do. And over all these virtues, put on love, or the love, which binds them, all the virtues, puts all of them together in perfect unity, in the perfect teleos, the completeness. In verse 15, then, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. In other words, when you've got all these virtues working together and you put on love and making sure the whole thing holds together as love as you consider others above yourself, realize this was the goal. Harmony, peace. This would, when, when the church is moving together, when a body of believers are socially moving together in this fallen earth with the Spirit of God, with the purpose and focus of Christ, and you're moving together in harmony, great things are going to take place. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, meaning let, let that continue to guide you, since as members of one body you are called to peace. In other words, this is tough, this is tough, and there's always a place to, you know, talk about division and separating and getting away from false doctrine or immoral behavior, and, and you know, we see Paul separating from Barnabas, we see Paul separating from different churches or different synagogues, so, I mean, th there's a place for all of that, but again, notice, we were called to peace. God's intention was that we would mature as a group of believers. We'd be able to work through our human differences, be able to forgive each other when we failed, continue to build, and continue in peace because that's what we were called. We were called to function. The church was designed to function as a group that was in peace, or maybe a better way of saying this, in harmony, striving together. Now, how do we stay on the same page? That's, he's going to tell you right here. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, individually and as a corporate body. In your hearts, the peace of God should be the thing, the peace of Christ should be the thing dictating where you're going. How are we going to handle this situation? We're going to handle it peacefully. Uh, uh, since we are called to peace, because that's what we are called to do, is handle this in harmony. And be thankful. That's another thing. We're peaceful with each other, thankful towards God. And verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And now right here, the word of Christ, where this is heading, and we looked at this last week, kind of where we wrapped up, when it says the word of Christ in the, in the book of Ephesians, a very parallel place right here, uh, it says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There it talks about the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And in Ephesus, at the very same point, the book of Ephesians is talking about the Spirit. And, you know, then it goes on, talks about singing and, and building each other up. In Colossians, it's not the Spirit, it's the Word. The Word is mentioned, and it's here identified as the Word of Christ. Now, uh, a good point, I think, as we look at the whole book, why and Don pointed this out last week right at the end, and, and, I, and I was glad he did because I, I, it, it's the theme of the book. I think as we talk about the, 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 the mystery, mysteries and the, and the angel visitations and, and the visions that they're having, Paul is really trying to lead them away from the Spirit. Now be careful. He's not trying to lead them away from the Spirit of God. He's trying to get them away from their misunderstanding of spirituality. You understand what I'm saying? The same thing takes place in Colossians. Spirituality in Col uh, Cor Corinth, in the Corinthian church, is completely off, off track. They've got their own form of spirituality, and Paul tries to recapture the pneumos. You know, he's re recapturing those of you that are pneumos will be living this way, not over here in this weird spiritual way that you've created. And I think we see the same thing taking place even in our own churches, our own lives, possibly. I know I've been through several ups and downs with this whole idea. But as far as the spiritual activities, it's like sometimes we misidentify what really is spiritual. And I think possibly in Colossians, the reason in Ephesians, and this is kind of like Donald's pointed this out last week too, in Ephesians, he's not afraid to talk about the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, because they understand what he means. He's talking about be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit, the joy of the Spirit. You've got this supernatural spiritual power. Let it radiate from you. But if he tells that to the Colossians, they've got a different understanding of be filled with the Spirit. That means have another vision or, or have another, visit another angel. And again, you can understand, when you talk about the Spirit, even today in different Bible studies or different groups of people or you're having conversation you know, across coffee or lunch with somebody, depending on what church they come from, what background they come from, when you say the Holy Spirit, bing, 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 a whole bunch of other images start firing in their mind. What do they hear, what do you hear when someone says Holy Spirit? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I was following the Spirit or the Spirit was working in me. Different people hear different things. Some think you've got to, you know, you know, hey, you understand. There's I can start giving you examples, but there's extremes all the way across the board. It is, it is interesting, though, at the same point of the letter, talking about the same thing and heading towards the same product, in Ephesians, he talks about be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and talks about singing and different expressions like this. In Colossians, he doesn't say spirit. He says, right, well, we read it again, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In Ephesians, it says right there, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In, in, in Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish each other. So now remember, we've got a church living together in harmony with love bringing them to the completeness. And then he says the word. And with that word, and now he's not talking to the leadership. He's not talking to the pastor. You teach and admonish the people. He's talking to the body. He's talking to all those people who are living with each other in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other, living in harmony. He says, let the, let the, let the peace rule you. Let that word of God, Christ fill you and then teach and admonish each other. And, and those are, these are two, actually in a sense, these are two gifts. And you've got to be careful with words that are gifts. Because so many times, there's a list of gifts, there's several times, there's a list of gifts like teaching or administration or giving or something like this. These are gifts that people have, but yet all of us are supposed to teach or to be over and organize something. All of us are to be giving something. I mean, it's not like, well, I'm the teacher, so I don't do any of these other things, or I'm the giver, I don't do any of these other things. It's like, we all have gifts, but yet we're all functioning somewhere. So this is one of those cases where gifts are identified, or the words are gift, could be gift terms, but he's talking to the whole congregation. And teaching, very quickly, teaching is the organization of facts in a, in, in, a, in a way that they're presented and communicated. So it, it's the communicating of organized information. And that's what teaching is. It's different than preaching. It, it's different than evangelism. Teaching is the organization. You organize in for the facts and present them in a way that can be understood. 
admonition is basically encouragement. It's encouragement with the direction being sent, uh, not just, you know, yeah, go get them, but the encouragement in a sense of, of morals and practical, I'll just write practical, application of, are you ready? What was taught, they go hand in hand. Teaching, I like to think of myself as a teacher. I like to organize, I mean, I like doing it. I mean, that's what I, I like to have things categorized, organized, and I like to have people receive this information. I like to put it in a way that's received. That's one part of it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach. Organize the information and present it to each other. But right along that, that word of Christ also has to be presented as an admonition. Uh, meaning it's a source of encouragement to do, take this teaching, this information, and have it affect your moral life, you know, sanctify yourself with this information, and then practically. Now what do I do with it? Okay, now that I'm a, a new creature in Christ and, and I'm, you know, what, what do I do with this? Well, there's a, it changes the way you do things. It changes the way you work, it changes the way you buy groceries, it changes the way you organize your checkbook, it changes the way you work, in a, your family works together. This teaching, and this is why, like the book that I, I put together, uh, The Word, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, what, the, what did I call the book? Uh, uh, apparatus, yeah, thank you, all of <laughs> the lovely students that don't read my book. Uh, the word, the apparatus for salvation, renewal, and maturity. This teaching of the truth will then come down and through the encouragement of it, it will change your life. And that's what he's saying right here. And be thankful, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So you believers, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And again, wisdom would be the the understand not knowledge, but wisdom would be that practical understanding insight of how you would apply it in your own life. It's going to tell you how to how to how to teach it here. It's going to be very interesting. But I do want to spend some time on the for just the phrase "word of Christ." Now, me being a Bible teacher, C H R I S T. I spelled Christ wrong the other night, like a couple of weeks ago. Before, you know, I, I, and on the board, I looked at the videotape, and Christ was written right up here and spelled wrong. <laughs> and I, the whole, it just, I mean, no matter what I said, I looked dumb. <laughs> I just wrote Christ wrong, and I could say I could take just brilliant things, but so he just he's standing in front of a chalkboard or a whiteboard with Christ spelled wrong. It's kind of like <laughs> just kind of defeats the whole message. I'm sure hundreds of people have hundreds. If that's me, do they get to that point? It's like just I can't just shut it off. You can't even watch it. Yet. But anyway, so I make sure I spell Christ. C H R I S T. Okay. Um, as a Bible teacher, I want to say Word of Christ refers to Bible teaching. It refers to the the written revelation. And I think that's probably safe. I mean, that's where I want to go with it. But what did it mean to the Colossians? You know, when they heard, I mean, I think we're safe realizing that's what it would mean. But what did they hear? Understanding the fact that they may not have even had a copy, a hard copy of one of the Gospels. They may not have had a Matthew, a Mark, a Luke, and they didn't have a John. You know, understand what I'm saying? Now, that's no attack on Scripture. It means those things were still kind of being put together, being transferred around. A lot of these people had just come into the faith. And so they did not have, they definitely did not have a New Testament. You understand? Because a lot was still being written, for example, this letter. So this word of Christ, it isn't necessarily this exact book in the context. Nor is the word of Christ, I think, because it, it, based on what the book is talking about, I don't think Paul's focusing on what is Christ saying to you personally. What is the word of Christ in your heart? You understand? That's kind of where he's trying to get these people away from, getting away from these visions. It's like, let's get back on the, on the truth. And so what is Word of Christ? It's not necessarily that special inner revelation. Probably what the Word of Christ is referring to. Again, you've you got to think about this and maybe do some more study on it. This is probably referring to the historical words of Christ. Now, they may not have had a copy of Matthew or Mark, but they did have, they have, they did have a collection of things that Jesus taught. You understand what I'm saying? It's hard for us to kind of even understand that or even imagine it. But they probably heard, they probably had understood, knew the Sermon on the Mount. They probably knew things that Jesus said his, during his last week of his ministry. There's probably bodies of information that they knew historically, although they may not have had the book of Luke. Or they may not have had, they did not have the book of John. Do you understand what I'm saying? They did know the things that Jesus taught. Because it was, it was just a few, few, you know, a couple decades before that, Jesus was moving about doing his teaching. 
So, when it talks about word of Christ here to the Colossians, it's probably talking about the historical message that Christ had brought, which included what's in the Gospels today, but maybe not in the same completed form that we've got. They're supposed to let that word of Christ, the historical word that he taught, dwell in them, and then they're supposed to internalize that so that in wisdom they can speak it to each other, teaching, organizing it, and presenting it to each other, and admonishing each other, meaning encouraging each other, to live it out in their life in a practical, moral way. Okay? Now watch how they do it. Are you ready for this? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, personally, so that as you then teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So one of the ways that they're going to be communicating and expressing their faith is going to be in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And again, the, the break, actually just to kind of start a discussion on this right here, the phrase spiritual songs, that word spiritual can actually, and it actually in, in the Greek refers to spiritual psalms, spiritual hymns, spiritual songs. That word can be applied to all three. They're all three right there. With gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. But again, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms would probably refer to the Old Testament collection of the psalms. Uh, hymns would refer probably to more of the uh, contemporary songs or the things that they'd written, doctrinal songs they'd written. One way of looking at psalms is that those were Jewish style. Hymns would be more of the Greek styles. These are the two cultures coming together. Uh, when you talk about psalms, you do want to consider the fact, uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians, just write this down. You don't need to go there right now. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Because right there, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Paul says, talking to the church, when you come together, everyone or each of you has a psalm. In other words, he's giving instructions for the church. The Corinthian church had kind of gone off the deep end, and the church service appeared to be really disorganized because everyone wanted to preach, everyone wanted to you know, speak in tongues, everyone wanted to prophesy. And so Paul says, okay, we've got, to get the, we've got to have some more order. He says, two or three at the most should prophesy. And the other prophets should then judge, meaning every one of you comes with a message. Everyone wants to participate, and everyone brings a psalm. That's what he says. Everyone has a psalm. Now imagine... Imagine the church, just kind of throw it in your, put it in your mind, coming to church, not just to sit and watch or be entertained or judge the sermon, but come to church with something waiting for the break in the service for you to give your presentation. Is that not a different? Imagine your church, and you're just, you've, got, you've got a message, you've got a, uh, something you want to share, an insight, a, a little maybe a, a story you want to share, maybe it's a, something God's put on your heart, maybe it's a prophecy. Maybe there's a song that you'd like to express to the Lord, and then you combine the whole thing with the spiritual manifestations taking place, and you're just kind of waiting for everybody else to kind of take a breath so you can jump in. And it says in those same verses, it says, if while the first speaker is speaking, the Lord gives someone else or the other one receives a message, you know, let's say a Marian receives a message, the first speaker should stop so that the second speaker could start. Now, that's not going to happen in my Bible study. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not going to come to Bible study and talk for five minutes, and someone else takes over, and I just sit down and take notes. It's like... It doesn't happen in many churches. Right. But, but, you, but you know the verse I'm talking about. That let the first speaker be quiet and let the other one talk. So, I mean, it's a different... different uh, and I'm not against it, but I mean, it's a different uh, environment than what we're used to. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, and so, what, I guess what I'm really saying that for in Psalms... It said, or in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, it says, when you come together, each of you has a psalm. And it uses the same word. So it's kind of interesting. Those would probably not be Old Testament psalms in this 1 Corinthians. That would probably be more of a spiritual inspired that God has given you a psalm that you'd want to sing. But Paul's telling everybody, not everyone's going to get to speak their prophecy. Not everyone's going to get to speak their, sing their song. He says, we're going to be here for, we'll be here until next week. <laughs> getting through everybody's presentation. So it, this is kind of an interesting contrast to what we've got today. But anyway, this kind of gives you a little more insight. Let me read verse 16 again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you individually as you teach and admonish one another. That's Again, that's not the pastors doing the teaching or the leaders doing the teaching, although they were. That's every individual in the church teaching and admonishing each other. 
uh, with all the wisdom. And as you sing, now here's three things, sing psalms, Jewish hymn, or Jewish uh, psalms out of, like, out of the book of Psalms, hymns, which would include some kind of like doctrinal songs, uh, probably a Greek style. Oh, hey, let's go to this. Go to, first, or go to Colossians chapter 1. I, just, I want to just show you this. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. And, and we've talked about this before, but Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, many uh, scholars think, as they exegete through the book of Colossians, that beginning in verse 15, what Paul is writing here is a hymn. It's one of those, you know, those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. From It'd be right from 15, uh, Psalm, uh, uh, excuse me, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Here we go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God has, was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And that would be the end of that hymn. And then it goes on. Once you were alienated, now he starts teaching it. It is possible, you know, and maybe some of you, does anybody have a Bible or the text where that's kind of set off in a poetic form or set off on its side? Okay. But some people think that that's would be an example of a hymn of praise. And go to Philippians. Go back another book to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Here's another one. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, verses 5 through 11. Now, in this case, in the NIV, this is set off in poetry fashion. Because this may have been a song or a hymn. You know, this would be one of the New Testament hymns. And notice, both of these are psalm, songs about who? About Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the center of the church service, of identifying him, of speaking about him, of teaching about him. We just went through that, if that Colossians verse that I just read, that's some heavy doctrine right there. I mean, there's been volumes written on what is said there. He is supreme over everything. He's the firstborn from among the dead. It goes on and on. Now look at this one. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 11. Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Now notice the context of this song. It's doctrinal. It's describing who Jesus is. It's describing his attitude and his character, which is going more down to this. It's the teaching, but also what is it? It's the admonition of now you clothe yourself like Christ. Christ was not arrogant. Christ did not put himself first, but he humbled himself and he became a servant, and your attitude should be the same. Our example is Christ. So anytime you start promoting yourself, putting yourself above, it's like, wait a minute, that's not what Christ did. Uh, you're out of line. Your, your behavior is not in line with the teaching. And so anyway, notice, again, I just pointed that out, that this, this song or this hymn, if it is a hymn, and many people think it is, is doing exactly that. It's teaching about Christ and then admonishing or encouraging you to behave practically and in your moral life in a similar fashion. I'm going to continue here in verse 7. But made himself nothing, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on, on earth, and under the earth, and at every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so there would be possibly another example of a spiritual hymn of the New, New Testament churches. And again, that's 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 worthy of a discussion, but it's definitely a worthy point to be made. I'm back in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, Old Testament psalms, 
right out of it, you know, in Jewish style, hymns, new doctrinal statements praising Jesus Christ, uh, which include doctrinal information or statements of faith, and spiritual song. And again, these these words I'm giving you, I, uh, uh, I'm kind of roughly describing these. These words need to be, you know, examined more, and you're not going to be able to necessarily nail them down completely because, again. Uh, we're not sure exactly the context we were using them in. We, like we said before, psalms. We had people in Corinth singing psalms in the church service just inspired by the Spirit. Okay. Uh, now, the spiritual songs would probably be, if we just say it this way, other songs that their verses or their lyrics come from God's inspiration, if it be uh, his, his uh, inspired spirit, his motivation, something where the spirit of God is producing something through you uh, in a gift form. Okay, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now this is the th second of three times we're going to mention gratitude towards God. Remember in verse 15 it ended, and be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell on you richly as you teach, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, if it be in teaching or admonishing, encouraging or in singing, or if it be in doing, something that you go off and physically do, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And now for the third time, giving thanks to God the Father through him, because he's the one who's empowered you to be able to do these things. And you can almost feel right here, we've kind of come to a conclusion right here. You see right here? We've gone all the way through talking about uh, because you are this special set apart people, you've been called to be holy, chosen by God, now clothe yourself with this new life, and now as a body with this new clothing, this new attitude you've put on, work together keeping peace, and keep that word of God, that truth in front as you continue to share it back and forth, teach each other, encourage each other, sing it to each other so you stay focused on the goal. And whatever you do, if you go off and you continue to teach and talk about it, or if you go off and you continue to do it practically in your life, whatever you do, do, do it in the name of the Lord and give thanks to God the Father because He is the one who's put you in this family with this kind of ability to live this kind of a life at this time in history. Okay? Now... Now he begins in verse 18, we begin a new list that's going to take you through a list of people from wives, husbands, children, fathers, slaves. Now we're into, again, the family of uh, masters is going to be mentioned in chapter 4. So between verse 18 of chapter 3 to chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 4, we're going to now start talking about how you would behave in culture. I think what we could have talked about right here, this is how you behave as a group of believers, as, as, as a body functioning together in harmony, in love, with these Christ-like characteristics, you're going to move through the earth in, in great fashion. But now, in a practical way, here's this would be an example of some of that admonition he was talking about. You understand what I'm talking about here? We go back to verse 16, where it says, teach and admonish one another. Paul has spent chapters 1, 2, and 3 teaching. He's giving you a categorical organized fashion of information about Jesus Christ and the new birth. And now, beginning in verse 18, he's now going to take and begin to admonish you. Now, this is how you live this way. Did, Jim, did you raise your hand? Well, I was going to say, back in 16, where it talks about the Word of Christ, could he not be referring to the three chapters he just wrote in that? Yeah, he could be, yeah. Because he certainly talks about God and I mean Christ mm -hmm. and, and all the characters and so forth that's in there. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. That, yeah. I guess the main thing I would want to point out about that is the word of Christ. I think would be a historical uh, something that was there. Okay, but the, the Colossians are not are the, they're pagans. I mean, would they have historical information? I, I think the so. Jewish. People? Because because uh, this church started from the Ephesian outreach. Paul's Paul's. Was in Ephesus for three years, and that's when the Colossian church started. You know, and, and he's been gone. He's now in Rome in prison, so it's been several years. So they've had time to get information from Ephesus and collect information. And and there's no reason to think that they don't have some kind of written information. For example, Luke researched and got information. So I think they've got some things written down. But when I say historical, I guess I mean more. Uh, I don't mean like 
historical information about Jesus' ministry, although I would include that, I would include in my word historical chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Colossians. I guess what I'm meaning is something hard, tangible in print, not something that they're on a mountaintop, you know, experiencing a spiritual revelation where angels are taken to the throne of God. I mean, something that he's trying to get them away from these Meribah visions and stuff and into the word of Christ. So that's, that's why when I say word of Christ, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw out that, the, 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 uh, the recorded value, including what you just said. Does that help? Is that no, agreeable? No, I'm just... But yeah, yeah I, especially he's, he's Paul is going to identify his book here in Colossians and Ephesus as the fullness of the word of God. So I mean, he knows what he's writing. Okay, so now we begin some rules for Christian households is what the NIV titles this. And there's, we begin with, they always come in pairs, you know, on wives and husbands and husbands and wives, children and parents, fathers and children, slaves and masters. There's always on how you're going to be interacting. And one of the, as we just kind of introduce this, one of the things that's going to be important is to notice a difference is the, between the word submit and the word obey. And there's a, listen, there's a thousand things. There are entire ministries built on these verses, okay? Rightfully so, because that's that, that's that teaching and admonition. Here's the basic information, and then there's all, you know, what, what's more important to a family than the husband and the wife and the children relationship? I mean, you know, like focus on the family. What a great ministry. You know, other ministries that are focused on this type of thing. But just, just kind of as we begin this, the concept of submit has the idea of having some kind of freedom, some kind of rights, something that you can submit to, that you can cooperate. Now, there is a divine order, and there's all kinds of discussions on this, but Paul, I think, throughout his writing, establishes there is a divine order. There's a difference, and you know these things, but I'm going to say them. There's a difference between uh, being placed in a position of authority and in the actual being uh, and your value. For example, the Trinity itself, what is more valuable? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? What is more worthy? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? They're the same. They're, they're, they're the Trinity. They are in the Godhead. But yet there is an order. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. The Spirit glorifies the Son. The Son leads you to the Father. The Father sends the Son. The Son sends the Spirit. So is there any kind of worthiness in the Trinity? No, it's, it's an order of function. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in this concept of submit, we could say Jesus submits to the Father. In the end, he's going to hand the whole kingdom back to the Father so everything can be complete. It's like, well, he did all the work. He's the hero. Right. But in his position, he's going to submit everything back to the Father so things will be good. So when we see the word submit, we are talking about, we're talking about freedom. We're talking about equality. We're talking about uh, worthiness. But we're talking about a choice to be brought into the correct order. Now, obey is a different type of word than submit. And you, you think about this, you decide. Obey is... Uh, used for fathers and children it's used for masters and slaves slaves obey you don't submit you either say yes or no you either have done it or you haven't done it children you obey it's either yes or no it is no like you don't submit you you don't have the freedom to submit you you are not on the same level you cannot submit you have to either obey or not obey now again that's just a very general introduction to what's taking place right here. Uh, let's read through, let's just read through uh, chapter 3 verse 18 down through chapter 4 verse 1. And what Paul is talking here, I'm still introducing it I guess, uh, some want to talk about this being cultural, that this was the culture of these people and it doesn't necessarily apply to us. You can go that way if you want to. Sometimes I think you do have to read culture into the text. Certain things that Paul commands uh, would be fitting for their culture, not fitting for us. Uh, again, the, the thing I would use as an example I've used before is nowhere in here are, are husbands commanded to wear their wedding rings because they didn't have wedding rings. It meant nothing. If they were commanded or they, there's other things that may be like commanded to do, that those things have passed away. Where I think it's very important to wear a wedding ring today because you are, again, in a position where this means something in our culture. This right here, these verses that we're about to read through here, 
I think these are universal. I think these are part of creation. I think, it, and Paul even ties them at different times back to the Creator. This is the way God the Father designed, uh, including designing, designing marriage first, and then after marriage, designing family. In other words, you've got to, marriage is a real thing that's got to be managed. It, it has priority. And then family has to be managed as far as husband or fathers and, and, and children and, and or parents and children. So these are two things. Again, this is mentioned. Family and marriage are established. We've talked about it before. They're institutions God has established. And within marriage, there's an order for that. God established family. Within family, there's an order for that. And you, you, can, you can change that if you, you can. We're trying to change marriage as a culture. You... You can, but you're, it, it's like you're not living right. I mean, you're destroying something. You can change family, but that's the way the world is designed. You can change, submit. You can change, obey. You can, you can decide that all the servants are supposed to be in charge of the masters. But that's not the way the world is designed by God. So anyway, here, let's read this. I think Paul is writing in a universal creation order that is not, it, it, he's applying to the Colossians, but he is applying to the Corinthians. I think you go back to the Old Testament. I think it applies to us at all times. Okay, here we go. Chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And that's in the middle voice, which means it's a volunteer effort. Husbands, don't make your wives submit. Wives, you have to make the choice. You have the freedom. You have the position. You have the worthiness to get in order or not. And it's not the husband's job to make his wife submit. or it's not, That's not the context of this right here. What's the husband's job? What's the husband's job? Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In other words, husbands, love your wives. Make, make, make your, their, their submission to you easy and don't be harsh with them, meaning don't even try to make them to submit. Don't even, try, don't even go there. You do it the right way. And again, the example is not here, but in Ephesians, it is in Ephesians, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, Jesus Christ is the judge. He is he's the soon coming king, and he will rule with an iron scepter. But our relationship with Jesus Christ right now is what? He is still Lord. He is still seated at the right hand of God. But what does he do? He loves us, and he's not harsh with us. He calls us. Do you want to come? Do you want to obey? You have, we have the ability to submit or, or not. Christ has put himself in a position where he's doing everything to make himself attractive and desirable, and we're convinced that we should submit to him. He's not harsh with us, beating us into submission. Again, there's a day coming. And husbands don't use this as a tool. But there's a day coming when Jesus Christ will rule and reign with an iron scepter. That is not, depending on your eschatology, that is not today. But anyway, husbands, our job, or, you know, I'm pointing to myself because I'm a husband. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. They will be the ones that will submit. You love them. Uh, and that's one thing I, and we've talked about this before, and I've, I've shared my, with this with my boys, is that, that circle of love, and it's really an elementary teaching, that circle of love, you know, the husband and the, the wife, you know, the love, this is the wife. The circle of love, this is the husband, this is the wife. The circle of love, it begins with the husband. If the husband will send love to his wife, if he will step out, I get this is what I teach my boys. It's easy for me, I've got, I'm, a, I'm a guy, I've got six boys. It's easy for me to teach. It's like, well, what about the other side? I don't even need to worry about that. <laughs> it's like, if, if the husband will love his wife, that's, that's, that's the jump set. That's going to cause the love to come. That's going to be the, the focus. He's the he's the seed. He's the uh, 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 again. He's the sun. I use this example. He's the sun shining on the moon. Now this is not derogatory towards women. It's just the, it's just the illustration. The sun is the source of the light that shines on the moon that reflects the love back. I mean, I I, I sincerely believe that. And I don't know how I don't know about necessarily about the wife side of it, but I do know that in my own life, when I shine, what I oh man, I gotta quit talking because we're running out of time. 
But what I send to, to my wife is what I eventually get back. It may be three days, it may be a week. But if I'm crabby, throwing things, pounding on things, she may be a strong woman today and she may be holding herself together, but by two days, three days, or the end of the day, end of the week, what's wrong with Tony? Well, she's got such a, well, she's so grumpy. It's like, oh, I know what's wrong with Tony. She's got a grumpy, grumpy husband. He, he, I'm, you know, I'm spending thunderstorms and all this stuff. And she's, and again, this is not derogatory to my wife, but I, if I will create a peaceful home, if I'll create a, a controlled environment, my wife will reflect that back to me. Again, that, that is, go back to this word to submit, that is in no means saying, oh, she's not able to create her own environment. Believe me, my wife can create, as all women, can create their own environment. But this is talking about, that's what the submit means. They've got the, they've got the ability to make their own choices. But what I create is what I get back. And husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to this, and you get that cycle of love. Anyway, that's a very, very elementary. Dale, I had a question. You're tough here. Don't make said, it too tough, please. You said submit, submit or be subject to your own husbands is voluntary. Is loving your wife voluntary? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's going to be in the active voice. I mean, you're going to do it. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, voluntary. Okay, I don't understand that because... Well, what, I, I don't know. You know I guess my, my, and we don't need to study it, but I think with the teachings that I've read that as a Christian man, I don't have the option. Oh, oh right, right, right. In the, in the order of things, right. I mean, husbands, love your wives. That's not like, you know... If that's what you choose to do. No, I think this is this is a, this is a command. Yeah. This is in the imperative mood. Active voice imperative, meaning you do this as a command. But you don't have. I mean, you may not. And the same thing. The wives submit. That's that's in the that's in, in the imperative. This is a command to the wives, meaning middle voice, meaning they're going to do it voluntarily. But it's a command. They may do it or they may not. So yeah, wives. The godly way, wives, yes, you submit to your husbands. Husbands, yes, you love your wife. There's no other way to do it God's way. But you don't, I mean, you can live and not do these things. Yeah, I mean, is that, yeah. No, I was just going to the fact that I, well, the wife might have the option. No, 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 no. No, that's not what I'm saying, no. Okay. I, no, I don't mean that, that you well, know. Voluntary and option kind of works in the same context as far as I was concerned. And I know that I don't think Scripture gives me an option. No, I see what you're saying. You're right. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. yeah. Go on. Yeah. No, this, I just I just want to point out these words. I see that you, you're talking about these two words right here. Right. Yeah. These are these are in the imperative. I mean, they're commands to do. Uh, but the submit is, is something that you can't you can't submit. You can't, in a sense, bring something and offer something if you don't have possession of it. She's got possession of the, uh, she can, even at the very fact, I, I'm rambling now, but even if at the very fact when she gets married and she marries a husband, she doesn't have to marry the husband. She can continue to be an individual. But by coming in and coming to the husband, she now submits. So she's bringing something and submitting it to this divine order called husband and wife. Um, children and, and masters and slaves or, or do I say children and slaves, they didn't really make a decision. You didn't really say, and now again, there's, I'll, I'll be examples. A slave, now these are not, we can use these masters and slaves as, a, as examples of employee and, 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 and business owners or whatever, bosses. But in the context, slaves, you were a slave, you didn't submit, you didn't say, you know, today I'm going to become a slave. I'm sure there's situations where they did. But you, want, you ended up being captive or you ended up in debt. You are now a slave. You obey. You can't submit because you are a slave. Children, you can't decide, I'm going to go ahead and be a child. You are a child. You obey. Wives have not always been wives. Wives were women. And they, you know, under their father's authority, whatever, that's another whole conversation there. But they went from being not being under a husband to being it. So they submitted and by making that step in, they, they voluntarily stepped in and now the right thing to do is to submit to that that order. If that may, that's kind of what I'm talking about here as far as they they do have I wanted to make sure with the kind of I wanted women are not slaves, women are not children. Women are equals who came into a, a divine position of 
husbands and wives, they came into this, and now in that position, they, they need to submit, but they voluntarily came in. They weren't captured. They weren't given birth to. That's kind of, I guess, kind of where I'm heading. That makes sense. And Marilyn knows a lot more about this <laughs> than I do. So I'm going to pray. <laughs> now, thank you very much. Thanks for your questions and thanks for your attention. Father, we come to you tonight. Again, we thank you so much for your divine order. We thank you for putting these things in perspective for us. And as always, I do ask that my words might be useful as we look at these scriptures and your divine word. But, Father, also that there would be others that would bring about either correction or a better understanding that we indeed may be those people you've called us to be, that we may live in harmony, that we may live in peace and, and, and abound in love, that we may reach that maturity and function uh, effectively as believers in, in union with other believers, but also in our own lives as family members or in, as employees, that we would live and manifest the goodness of God in our lives. And Father, we thank you so much for the good things you've done for us, and as we may continue to walk in your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here.